Doris Hare was born in the Romney Valley in 1905. She was steeped in the traditions of the theatre from birth. Her parents had a travelling theatre and toured all around the valleys. Uh, they were living in wagons, caravans, and my mother was born in a caravan in Bargoid. On their visits to Bargoid, Doris's family would erect the Bremers Alexandra Theatre under this viaduct. Her parents, Bert and Kate Bremer Hare, made their living carting their portable show and its troupe of actors from one pithead village to another. They were taking very popular type of theatre right into the heart of the countryside to villages where people couldn't easily get to the theatre. You remember, it was before the days of film, radio, let alone television. There was nothing. It was the entertainment. They travelled with flatbed wagons, and the four flatbed wagons made the stage, and then around that they built the theatre. So when you arrived anywhere, the first thing for the actors was the hammer call, and all these actors travelled with your own hammer. We don't have any images of the Bremers Alexandra Theatre, but it was very much along the lines of a touring theatre, uh, which we do have a photograph of. Now, in this case, it's a marionette theatre, um, but you can see that they've got a, a facade which would have been built up. Um, the family lived on caravans. And here you've got canvas sides and a canvas top, so you don't have to worry about the British weather. Sides here, again material, but amusingly painted to look like brick and then boards outside to say what they were doing. The company performed six different plays a week, with a concert beforehand and a farce afterwards. The type of thing that they were producing would have been popular melodramas, Dick Turpin, things that the audiences could really get involved in. They could shout and cheer and clap, something that would take people out of their ordinary lives and into a new world of theatre. Doris made her stage debut when she was three weeks old, playing Eliza's baby in Uncle Tom's cabin. People say to me, well, where did you train? And I said, well, I didn't. I was born, I was on. Yes, you started yes. in three weeks? Three weeks. What was, it, on. what was it like at the beginning? I don't remember my first appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I had very few lines. Doris's first speaking part came at the age of three. She had one line to say, which was, my father never told you to do that which she said and then burst into floods of tears. And she was a great little child actress. When Doris was a young girl, her baby brother fell ill. Their father rushed off stage to seek help. He set off to fetch the doctor, which meant running over the hill and into the next valley. Got a chill, it turned to pneumonia, and he died, leaving my grandmother with five children, the youngest only a small baby. There was a show scheduled that night, and the show went on. But you know, losing Bert was obviously a, a total disaster, and they were extremely poor. Kate Bremer Hare was left running the show and feeding her family on her own when tragedy struck a second time. Their theatre was destroyed in a violent storm. The family struggled on, but at the age of seven, Doris left to make her own way in the world, touring Britain as a member of juvenile variety troops like the Five Bing Kids. The world of variety grew out of the world of music hall, and this was the great type of entertainment for the working man. And it consisted of a lot of different turns, song and dance, magic, ventriloquism, a huge range of different types of performance, even things that we associate more with the circus. My mother, as a dancer, said it was awful if you were the next act on after the sea lands because the stage was awash and usually rather smelly. Doris was doing two or three shows a day, six days a week. Sundays were spent traveling to the next venue. They traveled around with the matron to look after them. Living in theater digs, which were always freezing cold. My mother in later life loved to be warm. She said too much of her early years had been spent in theater digs, freezing. Variety, with its different disciplines and array of stars, was a fantastic training ground for a young performer. She always stood on the side of the stage and she watched other people. She watched the dancers, watched actors, watched comedians. She was always learning. 
In her early teens, Doris put all that she'd learnt into practice when she began her solo career, as little Doris Hare, accompanied by her sister Winnie on piano. There's a playbill here for the Alhambra, Leicester Square, and Doris Hare here is on the bill. She was an extraordinarily good all-round entertainer. In Variety, I did a 12-minute act with three changes of costume, a dance, a splits, the lot. And my sister Wynne played the piano for me. Well, she wasn't a very good pianist. She played with two fingers. And when she got nervous, her, her lip used to go up like this. <laughs> and she'd be sitting there doing And she used to do this terrible thing and sing. As she's coming on now, she won't be long. And then she comes, she sing a sailor song. I oh, hear she's now, she won't be long, to sing a little sailor song. And I was at the side with a dresser who never knew what to do having this quick change into my sailor suit and shoes, tap shoes. And this girl, she said, you'll have to keep still, Miss Sirs, I can't get in. I said, come on, hurry up, get on there. And she do it on. And I said, I, so then she said, ah, my poor sister, lip had gone up to her head now. <laughs> <laughs> With these two fingers. And she said, ah, here she comes to sing a little sailor song. And I came on doing my sailor song. And I went into my routine which was uh, and she got my shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> During the 1920s, Doris toured Britain, Africa and Australia, singing, dancing and doing impressions. But tastes were changing and variety was giving way to a new, more sophisticated form of theatrical entertainment. What's really smart and new are these wonderful reviews. The Review was a Broadway creation, a musical show with the cast performing song and dance numbers and sketches in an evening of glamorous entertainment. The master of the film was Noel Coward, one of the wittiest songwriters of the 20th century. In 1932, he invited Doris to audition for his next production. So off I went, the Adelphi Theatre, 10 o'clock in the morning, and did the whole of my act. And when I'd finished, Noel said, I'd like to see you down in the stalls, Miss to come down to the stalls there. So I said, yes, when I've changed, I changed, I went down in the stall. He said, I think you're very, very funny. <laughs> and I should like you to be in my new review. I said, good, and I dashed from the stage door of the Adelphi Theatre to our flat in Longacre, quicker than any runner ever. I flew up the stairs to my mother and I said, Kate, I've got it. And she said, good, let's have a drink. <laughs> Coward. Like Doris, grew up as a child actor. He was a singer and a dancer, and he would have appreciated just how talented uh, little, little Doris Hare was. In 1932, Doris appeared in Coward's new review, Words and Music. And Noel wrote the most lovely song for me in that. It's called Three White Feathers. And it's about uh, an actress who's married into the peerage, and she's seated in the mail in a beautiful motor car, waiting to be presented at court. We lived at Ealing, me and me mother and father. I've scaled the social ladder, and I've never had a head for heights. We had a pawn shop at the corner of the street, and father did a roaring trade. I used to think those rings and necklaces were sweet. Now I wouldn't give them to my maid. I've traveled a long, long way. The journey hasn't been all jam. I must admit, the roles in which I sit is one up on the dear old tram I say to myself each day indefinitely marble halls today it may be three white feathers but yesterday it was three brass balls Doris not only sang in the review, she also appeared in one of Coward's satirical sketches. 
The sketch was called Children's Hour, and in it, it had Doris Hare with the young John Mills, and they were playing children in nursery who were aping what their parents did. So they were smoking, and they were drinking cocktails. And there was a song called Let's Live Dangerously, and they did some wonderful dancing in, in Children's Hour. Words and Music was a roaring success. The Times declared it Coward's best musical work to date. At the end of the show, he brought John Mills and Doris to the front of the stage and said, and these are my two young stars and you'll be seeing a lot more of them. In 1936, Doris appeared on Broadway in Emlyn Williams' sensational play, Night Must Fall. Her sister Betty was also performing in New York at the time. The Hare sisters were in their element among the bright lights of the city. It really was a marvellous time to be in New York. And of course, in those days, everybody did party pieces. And so Betty and I decided we would do Jazz Baby, but sung like the English do. He was a ragtime trombone player. My man, he was a ragtime cabaret. They met one day at a tangle tea. There was a syncopated wedding, and then came me. Folks say the way I walk is a fad, but it's a birthday present from my mammy and dad. Cause I'm a jazz baby. A little jazz baby, that's me. There's something in the tune of a saxophone. Makes me want to do a wriggle on my own. Cause I'm a jazz baby. For the jazz of harmony. That walk the dog, the ball, the jack, the course of the talk. It's just a copy of the way I naturally walk. Cause I'm a jazz baby. A little jazz baby, that's me. How's that? <laughs> When war broke out, each branch of the British Armed Forces was given their own distinctive radio programme. However, the Merchant Navy, which was a civilian service, had none. Merchant seamen faced the same dangers as other members of the Armed Forces. 30,000 of them died, keeping vital supply lines open during the war. In 1942, producer Howard Thomas set out to create a show for them, called Shipmates Ashore. He called Doris and asked if she'd like to present the show. He chose her because she had a wonderful, warm, down-to-earth personality, rather than being an ultra-glamorous leading lady. Oh, hello, shipmates. Welcome to the party. Well, as you can see, this is a sort of reunion. I'm so happy to be here because I've got so many of my old friends. I've got Scandinavians, Dutchmen, Aussies, some of the boys from Limpsfield, some from Springbok, and a Scotsman. Because this is a free party, and I can promise you there are always plenty of Scotsmen at a free party. Isn't that, isn't that so, John? Oh, that's right, John. She had the song Sailor Who You're Dreaming Of Tonight, which she sang at the beginning and end of each show. The programme was broadcast from the Merchant Navy Club in London's West End, which was packed with scores of young sailors on leave from active service. I mean, this was the height of the Battle of the Atlantic, and these people were coming back of horrendous experiences. I met some of the most wonderful men during the war in that programme. And I used to sit at a table writing postcards and write on them, you know, signing things. And a sailor said, he said, it's all right, Doris, I've got one of those pictures of you. But he said, do you know the last time I saw that picture? I was in a terrible ship right up at the tip of Iceland. It was freezing cold, it was a terrible ship, and you went down three stairs to the galley, which was ghastly. And over the top of the galley was written, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. <laughs> and underneath was your picture. <laughs> if there are any merchant seamen listening, I still love you all, and it's still love from Doris. Oh, I had a wonderful time during the war, you know. How many of them did you love? Them, did you? Oh, all of them. <laughs> oh, I, I was the sweetheart of the merchant navy, dear. Blimey. And baby, when I go on a ship now, they say, 
Doris, mother, they're all a bit older. Still. Well, Many still... a good tune played on an old fiddle. Oh, my darling, and you can do anything with those sailors. And it was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, was so, I used to be introduced at that time to various dinners and luncheons and things that I used to do. And they were said, and now we have Doris Hare, who is here to entertain us and, and to open the bazaar for us, who has done so much to sailors. <laughs> it should have been for, for sailors. During one recording session for Shipmates Ashore, War suddenly came to the Merchant Navy Club. Let's turn the telescope on Claude Halbert, now appearing in Panama Hattie, and Enid Trevor. Claude! Uh, here I am, Lloyd. Here I am. Just made the most amazing discovery. They are absolutely necessary in all war. And that was when the bomb dropped on the Merchant Navy Club. It was the most terrifying moment because all the ceilings started to come down and Bill de Broy Summers didn't know what to do. And Howard Thomas came out of the control room and said, keep it going, keep it going, we're still on the air. Shipmates Ashore made Doris a household name. She now had friends in the very highest circles. Now, I had a great chum that was in the government called George Tomlinson. And when the King and Queen came, George took them all over the Merchant Navy Club. So afterwards, I said to him, George, you talk to the King and Queen so much, what did they say to you? So he said, well, Dolly Slough, it was like this, you see. Queen was standing there, and of course, why not was supposed to come and look after her? And he wasn't there, he didn't come. So I went over to her and I said, hey, Your Majesty, nobody seems to be looking after you. <laughs> and she said, nay, there doesn't, does there? <laughs> So I took her in hand and I took her up the stairs and when we got to the top of the stairs there were all those lovely flowers and she got to the top of the stairs and she said, Eh, hey, what lovely flowers. <laughs> and I said, aye, your majesty, they wouldn't have been there if you hadn't have been coming. <laughs> and she said, nay, I thought not. <laughs> because of the war, the BBC's light entertainment department had been moved out of London to Bristol. There, Doris met a research scientist from Denbyshire, working at the Naval Hospital. Sparks flew, and on the 15th of March, 1941, Doris Hare and John Fraser Roberts were married. He absolutely adored the theatre. I think he also adored actresses. And he was quite a sort of reserved man, but he, he loved the sort of... the fun and, and the laughter and the exuberance of my mother. In 1942, Doris and John had their first child, Susan. The family moved from Bristol to Wimbledon, and it was there, after the end of the war, that their second daughter, Kate, was born. Doris was by now a well-known and much-loved public figure. But with peacetime, her role as the sweetheart of the Merchant Navy came to an end. Doris didn't take this lying down. She bombarded the BBC with ideas for new programmes that would showcase her talents. 8th of April, 1949. Dear Miss Hare, I am sorry to have to disappoint you, but I can see little opportunity of being able to include a programme on the lines which you suggest. Thank you for your letter. I'm sorry the idea didn't work out. However, I'm sure I'll be back soon with something wonderful. 8th of September, 1952. Thank you for your memo of the 27th of August. I am afraid that there is no foreseeable prospect of any such program being accepted. To make matters worse, Doris found that opportunities in the theatre were also drying up. During the 1950s, well, she hit her own uh, sort of late 40s, 50s, often a difficult time for actresses. Variety was disappearing and the theatre was beginning to change. There was a revolution afoot in British theatre, spearheaded by modern, passionate plays like John Osborne's Look Back in Anger. Suddenly, traditional drawing room farces were out of style. Doris was still appearing in plays, three acts, one set, and a French window at the back. And they would take a play out on tour, try it round the provinces, hope that it would come into the West End, and either it never did, or in one more memorable occasion, it came in and lasted one night. Um, and that was a very difficult time. 
Doris's career took a decisive turn when she appeared in a musical about a bunch of eccentric Edwardians at a seaside spa. She appeared in uh, Sandy Wilson's musical version of Falmouth, and she played Granny Took, who's 120, and suddenly people realised that she was a very good character actress. Also appearing in Falmouth was a young singer called Cleo Lane. Eamon Andrews reunited the pair a few years later. We used to sing to each other, uh -huh. and I used to sing all the old Cockney songs, and you used to jazz them up. That's right. Do you remember? Uh -huh. And do you remember one I used to sing to you? Airy, 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 airy. Yeah. <laughs> now you've got a chance to marry a nice little widow with a nice little pub. Plenty of Becky beer and plenty of grub. <laughs> Doris's performance as Granny Took opened new doors for her. She found herself swept up in a new wave of gritty British cinema. In the kitchen sink drama A Place to Go, Doris showed her range as an actress. No, you don't, Matt. You don't sit there no more. That's you mean. It's the head of the table. Well, this is where I sit. It's the head of the table. Ricky sits there now. He's paying for the food, so he sits there. Look, this is my place. Not anymore, it ain't. You sit where I tell you. Has Lil Flint, Doris revealed a harder edge to her performance. Since when have you told me what to do? Since when, eh? Oh, Mum, I can't... You keep out of this. Now, listen, Lil, you, you keep your mouth shut, I'm telling you. You don't tell me nothing no more, Matt Flint. You chuck up your job, you just fling away your job. What rights have you got any more? That same year, Doris joined Peter Hall's new Shakespeare company, the RSC. That period with the Royal Shakespeare Company was quite remarkable. There were very well-known people like Michael Horden, Dorothy Tutin, and Paul Schofield. But the youngsters in the cast were Diana Rake, Judy Dench, Mike Williams, uh, Ian Holm, Ian Richardson, um, Timothy West. It was a quite fantastic time and she did some wonderful stuff with them. Doris Hare was able to bring years of experience to the Royal Shakespeare Company. One of her roles, for example, was, was the nurse in, in Romeo and Juliet. And again, that's the kind of character she would have done extremely well because she had such a range of types of performance that she'd worked in. But the role for which Doris would be remembered longest came in 1969, when she was offered the part of Mum in On the Buses. Oh, she loved On the Buses. She really did. It was an immensely popular show. And, of course, it gave her a whole new audience. And she was recognised everywhere she went. Uh, she took her two sisters and they went off on holiday to Yugoslavia. And they went on a coach trip one day, and at the top of some mountain, out of a little cafe, a woman appeared, rushed up to my mother, shrieking, Mommy, Mommy, autobus, autobus! And apparently it was a big success in Yugoslavia. On the Buses attracted audiences of over 7 million viewers. It spawned three films and was sold to 38 countries worldwide. Doris followed up that success with appearances in the Confessions films, which centred on the sexual escapades of ladies' man Robin Asquith. <laughs> this was always a family joke because she always insisted that she never knew they were going to be like that, because, of course, she'd only been in the family scenes. Now, my son said to her very firmly, come on, darling, we'll accept that for the first one, but she did four more after that. But she thought it was great fun. No, she, she enjoyed doing those. She liked with them. It's a wonderful feeling. After a lifetime in the theatre, Doris Hare died on the 30th of May 2000. She was aged 95. May I just say to all the sailors everywhere, I shall never forget you ever. God bless you. Good sailing and love from Doris. Say hello, you're dreaming of tonight As you're swinging to and fro in your hammock down below Say hello, you're dreaming of tonight I'll wager that you're dreaming of a day